Hi everyone and welcome to the first part of your lesson today on research methods. So obviously as I'd said to you in yesterday's lesson, um, you were going to be doing just research methods in today's um, session. There's going to be nothing on approaches. So the first thing that we need to do on research methods today is to finish off what we'd started uh, last week when I wasn't there obviously and in yesterday's lesson which is taking a look at sampling. So before we go any further just to recall a few things that we discussed in yesterday's lesson, a little bit about what the sampling process involves. So if you recall um, from the lesson, I'd said that the sampling process is really something, quite a difficult challenge that all researchers face, whereby you are trying to ensure that the sample, your group of people who actually take part in the experiment, is as representative as absolutely possible of your target population. So if you imagine your target population, as we said yesterday, is this huge group of people that you want to be able to apply all your findings to, then it is absolutely crucial that your sample is representative. It includes one of each of all those types of people with in that sample. If it is representative, then you can generalise back from your sample, the teeny tiny group, back out to your target population. If it isn't and it's an unrepresentative sample, then as we mentioned yesterday, you will have what is known as a sample bias. So if it's not representative, it means it's skewed in favour of a certain characteristic. So for example, if you had um, a target population which was all males and you only did a piece of research which involved all females, that is a sample bias. It is not representative of male behaviour and for that reason, you would obviously struggle to generalise your findings out. So the aim of of kind of picking a specific sampling technique is to use a technique which is as representative of that target population as possible okay so We'd also said in yesterday's lesson that there are five different uh, kind of sampling techniques available to a researcher and we'd gone through the definitions of those in yesterday's lesson. If you have now in front of you the big A3 sheet, what you'll see is that some of the definitions have already been filled in for you, some of them are missing. If you want to pause this now, if you can remember what the definitions of the sampling techniques are, the ones that are missing, then you can by all means fill that in now on your own, so you can pause me and have a go at doing that, however I will be going through that later on. So we've got ROVs is the easy way to remember it, random, opportunity, volunteer, systematic and stratified, okay? So your random sample is the most um, kind of favoured method of getting hold of participants. However, it's not that regularly used, it has to be said by researchers, just because of the problems it poses and also random sampling um, works on kind of the assumption that everybody's got an equal chance in terms of participating but obviously as I think we've discussed before in lesson sometimes chance doesn't always work in your favour and you don't necessarily end up with a truly random sample okay so just be careful with that one so we've got random sampling is the one that you would try to go for but then obviously because of its restrictions you might want to pick one of the other four so opportunity sample, we said is uh, just people there. Volunteer, you advertise and they get in touch with you. Systematic, putting some sort of coding system onto your target population and stratified. So you can have a go at filling that in. If not, fill it in with me as we're going through it. Mm -hmm. So basically, all we're going to do now in terms of the rest of this little session on sampling is to get to grips with the bog standard descriptions of the sampling techniques but more importantly what their relative strengths and weaknesses are. Now what I will say to you as what and what you can see already here in terms of what has already been partially completed with the strengths and weaknesses is that the sampling techniques do have overlaps in terms of their strengths and weaknesses. So some of them are very similar 
possibly in the sense that they will give you a more representative sample. Some of them are similar in the sense that they are very convenient or very easy to do, that they'll save you time. Some of them are quite difficult to obtain or difficult to achieve. So basically, you've only got kind of three or four evaluation points that you need to learn here, and then you just reuse them um, in terms of the five different sampling techniques, and then you just explain them in different ways, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to work our way through each sampling technique and look at its strengths and weaknesses. So the first one, which is the one that I've just been speaking of, is a random sample. Remember, the most favoured sampling technique of all uh, researchers, but not often used. So every participant is given an equal chance. And remember, we said that we use kind of lottery systems, normally computerized lottery systems, it has to be said, um, whereby you select uh, random names or random numbers, and there is absolutely no bias. So you're not picking specific types of people, you're not approaching any specific type of person, every single person is equally as likely to be selected. Remember, if you recall from yesterday's lesson, that that's not the end of the story. Once you randomly selected those people, you then have to contact them and invite them to participate. Ultimately, all of them have got to be contacted because you've got to get them in front of you to actually do your piece of research. So always remember to say that on the end. So what is the strength of random sampling? Why is it probably the most favoured of all of them? Reason is that because it works on this chance system, okay, and there's no bias at all imposed by the researcher, it is, technically speaking, more likely to give you a representative sample because everybody's got an equal chance. So if chance works accordingly, then what you should end up with is a really, really varied group of people because there's no bias being imposed on your selection process. So the strength is that it does normally end up being more representative. However, what we also need to have a look at is what the weaknesses are. Okay, so as you can see then, the weakness of random sampling is that it is, largely speaking, one of the more difficult to truly achieve. Um, we've said that if it works in the way that it's supposed to do, fantastic, it's going to be really representative. But it's very, very difficult to get hold of that truly uh, kind of like unbiased sample. Why? Because if you think about it, in order to give everyone the equal chance, you have got to actually have access to your entire target population first. So to get a truly random sample, you've got to that have that massive pot of people available to you first and foremost and that often just doesn't happen in reality so whilst every researcher would probably prefer to be able to use a random sample and um, it's not always doable it's, it practically it doesn't always work so remember, random sample, if you ever get asked to do it in the exam, everybody's given an equal chance using some sort of lottery system. There's no bias for that reason. It is supposed to give you a more representative sample based on equal chance, but it's really difficult to do because you have to have every single person from your target population available to you first. The second sampling technique that we're going to have a look at is opportunity. So we'd said in yesterday's lesson that opportunity sample is just kind of approaching people who are there and readily available at that time. You do not need to do a great deal to get hold of um, kind of your participants. So I said to you yesterday, if I was doing an opportunity sample experiment, I would use you lot. All right, you're there in front of me and you are readily available. So what's the strength then? 
Obviously, obtaining your sample in that way is really, really convenient. It's not like random sampling where you've got to go through the whole stress of getting hold of the entire target population first and then generating numbers and names and contacting mm -hmm. them. It is literally, um, you use the people who are there in front of you. And I reckon you will have probably all been targeted by opportunity samplers before. It's those people kind of uh, accost you in the street using clipboards that's a random sample okay they're just approaching you because you are there at that time so it is really really convenient because if you think of it from the researchers point of view um, it's going to take you way less time because uh, all you're doing is going and standing in one place or taking people who are already there they already exist so it's very very convenient and for lazy researchers which is most of them, uh, it will be a, a more favoured kind of research sampling technique to use. However, it does have its downsides. Because of the way that you are approaching and inviting people that are all in one place all at one time, it's inevitably going to be uh, less representative. So it's unlikely to truly represent everyone in your target population. And remember we said that's what you want to be achieving. So opportunity sample is one of the ones that will give you an unrepresentative sample. The reason why for this particular particular sampling technique is that the participants will share similar characteristics because they're all in one place um, or from one specific kind of group of people they're probably going to have some characteristics that are collectively shared for example if it was a geographical location then they would have that if it was a shared geographical location then that might mean that they've also got things like class in common with one another potentially ethnicity if for example sample I was going to do an opportunity sample of you lot then I could assume that you've got similar levels of ability you've all got the right requirements to do a level psychology you've all got similar interests uh, personality traits might also be something that we all kind of share in common when we use an opportunity sample so whilst it's convenient you're not really going to get that of a that much of a representative sample. So for that reason, unless you're being lazy, it's probably the one of the kind of like least desirable uh, ways of getting hold of a sample. Similarly, we also have volunteer sample. Okay, now volunteer sample is very very uh, commonly used in psychology, especially um, for university research. Uh, advertisements just kind of go up on the walls in student halls or in university buildings and then basically the students are the participants and they approach the researchers so it's very very widely used in terms of university research so all it is is a self-selected sample you advertise the procedure you advertise what you're going to be doing obviously if you don't want to give away the aim then you just give some minor details mm -hmm. of the research um, so then all you do is you advertise it and you provide them with your contact details and all you do is you sit and wait. They respond with their consent if they want to participate. So again, like we had with opportunity sampling, it's also going to be really, really convenient because you're not doing hardly anything. All you are doing is advertising. They come to you. That's why it's called self-selecting, okay? So you can be uh, a little bit lazy all you got to do is get your out advert out there by email or by putting posters up things like that and then the participants rel readily volunteer themselves however same as with opportunity sampling it's also not really going to give you a very representative sample but for different reasons. Whereas with opportunity sample the problem is that if you pick from a specific part of people who are available at that point in time, they will fundamentally be similar in some characteristics. If you ask people to volunteer themselves for a piece of research, the types of people that put themselves forward tend to have certain characteristics in common. So a lot of the time they show a little bit more willingness. They tend to be a specific type of person who wants to participate actively in research. 
also they might have a little bit more time on their hands so depending on where you're advertising your research you do tend to get a lot of elderly people participating uh, potentially kind of like housewives people who are unemployed a lot of student participants um, they don't necessarily reflect the average person in the population because they, they tend to just be a little bit more um, easily swayed to participate in the in the research so again it's going to be a little bit biased in favor of those types of person on to the fourth sampling type which we said is the mm -hmm. only one that involves some sort of uh, formulated calculation we've got stratified so stratified um, involves using or identifying groups, which if you want to use the fancy name for them, they are called stratas, okay? So stratas are individual subgroups that exist within your target population. What you do, as we said yesterday, is you work out the proportions of people that need to be included in your sample for it to represent everyone equally. So we did that whole kind of like male and female strata, uh, working out how many men and how many women we needed to represent the sample in total. So it, what you do is you work out, you form, you uh, formulaically work out who is going to be required and the same as with random, once you've selected those people you've got to then contact them and invite them to participate. In terms of its strengths, it is going to be representative. If you think logically about it, the researcher is no way being biased um, in the way that they select the participants. Everyone, because you're working on proportions and ratios and what have you, everyone is equally represented. However, as you probably already guessed, it's really, really difficult to obtain for the same reason as what we'd said with random. Because you need to know what the subgroups are within your target population, you have got to know what the entire population is and have access to it before you can then select from it. So again, it's very difficult to actually get hold of everyone in the entire population. Furthermore, which makes it even more difficult, you not only need to know what the target population is and have some sort of data on everyone in it, you also need to know which subgroups exist within that target population and also who fits where. Sometimes there are overlapping subgroups and it's difficult to categorise people. So it's not always possible to know everybody in the target population and also yeah. specifically what subgroups exist within it. So stratified is probably the least commonly used but in terms of your exam you probably need to write this down. It is one of the more commonly questioned uh, sampling techniques because they can get you to work out the formula. All right. So whilst we don't really use it practically speaking the examiners will try to test your knowledge on that. And then lastly, we've got to consider systematic sampling. And systematic sampling is, um, again, using this idea that you are selecting people from your target population and you're imposing some sort of order onto uh, that target population. As it says there, this is commonly referred to as the sampling frame. Um, for example, selecting every nth person. By every nth person, we mean if you've got a sample of 100 people or a target population of 100 people, your sample would be every 10th person in that list. So same as with random and with uh, stratified, systematic sample involves selecting them first and then contacting them to come forward. It will give you a representative sample, so random sampling, stratified sampling and systematic sampling all increase the likelihood that you will get a representative sample. Why? This one again does not impose impose any bias at all okay all the researcher is doing is imposing some sort of ordered system onto the target population they don't have any kind of say or any preference as to who's being selected not like you would with opportunity and volunteer for example however this one is really bizarre because what you will see is that the strength is that it is representative but the weakness is that it isn't always representative. So it should give you a nice unbiased representative sample 
It doesn't always work out like that. Reason being is if you think about it again logically and realistically, you're not actually giving everyone an equal chance of participating. So if I were selecting a sample of 50 out of a target population of 100 and I'm saying that I'm collecting every second participant in my list that means instantly through no fault of their own everybody who is number one number three number five number seven and so on and so forth um, they are instantly eliminated from the sample they do not have a fair chance of participating so if you're doing things that way you're not necessarily going to end up with um, a representative sample because in that example what I've just said you're losing 50% of your target population straight away which really reduces the chances of it being truly representative so you should now have that completed in its entirety what I'd like you to do is just have another read back through it. Try to test one another. Obviously, I know it's going to be a bit weird because you're all kind of working through this individually, possibly with your headphones on. But once you can see uh, that you're all kind of at the same stage, then maybe try, try testing each other. Once you've done with that, what will be at the front in your blue box, because um, I've left them there this morning, is uh, 10 questions on the sampling techniques. Some of them are description questions, some of them are evaluation questions. I would like you to try and have a go at doing those without anything in front of you. So put that big A3 sheet uh, to one side once you feel confident enough. Answer the 10 questions. Once you've done with that, all I want you to do is send me a picture of the 10 questions so that I can see that you've done it and then also send me a little snapshot of the completed A3 table. Now you do have a little bit of uh, directed independent learning in relation to the sampling which is due for next Tuesday's lesson. Um, all I want you to do is go through the five sampling techniques in your booklet between pages 22 and 26 and fill in the blanks. You already know all this material from the summary table anyway, so it's just a case of going back over it. Obviously, a lot of focus from me anyway in getting you to realise that once you walk out of the classroom, it doesn't stop. So going back over that. Next Tuesday, there will be some exam questions, <coughs> further exam questions sorry on the sampling techniques um, we already did some in yesterday's lesson but uh, we're going to do a few more sampling questions next Tuesday as well as just a quick 10 point comprehension test um, if you understand the sampling techniques thoroughly it's good to mention to you here that you don't necessarily have to be restricted by the evaluation points that are in your booklet you could if you wanted to explain them kind of in your own way if you don't understand them clearly though obviously it's going to be better for you to try and just rote learn or memorize the things that are in your booklet at this stage so stop this video now then and have a go at doing all the kind of remaining sampling uh, little tasks for you and then once you finish with sampling the second half of the lesson is going to be on experimental designs.